I have anything to say. Great. That I think is intelligent and interesting. Wow. And relevant. Look at you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you gotta open it first. I right? know, I know. <laughs> Cheers, welcome to Wagner's Nightmare. Well, hello, Liam. So here we are with episode um, somewhere between four and nine of Wagner's Nightmare. Mm -hmm. We also phone have phone. a. Yeah. You're getting a phone call. You gotta hit that do not disturb, man. <laughs> <laughs> so let's call it episode eight of the podcast because we have like these mini series on NFTs and we also have like guests on. I think we should segment like what parts of the podcast are, are which. Um, and uh, we are at the end of our East Coast tour here. We just did six concerts, and tonight is our last one of the program that we're going to record next week. Um, Dan and I are going up to Rockport for that, and then um, it will be all virtual interactions for us from then on until probably February. So without further ado, I'll let Dan introduce our, um, our guest for today. Mm -hmm. And Dan's the newest licensed, dri licensed driver in the state of Massachusetts. Oh, are you? Just wanted to say that, yeah. Nice. Great. Yeah. Hey, man, congratulations. Thank you. Well done, yeah. well done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well oh, done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we have a really fantastic guest today. Happy to introduce Julian Manresa. Did I say that right? Manresa. Manresa. Julian Manresa. And um, Julian just finished at Yale, but he's not just any recent undergraduate. Um, he had finished his BA in comparative literature, cum laude, studied Austrian theater, opera, and performance history particularly, and he is heading to Clare College at the University of Cambridge in the, just a couple weeks. And he'll be studying theology and the philosophy of religion, and he's a recipient of a very prestigious Paul Mellon Fellowship. Um, so we are really excited to have Julian on, and uh, particularly because of this excellent dissertation he wrote about the Salzburg Festival and some of the key differences between Austria and Germany and uh, the Salzburg Festival and Bayreuth. Um, so it's really interesting stuff that's relevant to what we're doing. So it's really great to have you on, Julian. Thank you. Uh, Especially yeah. on a topic that I feel like I've spent so much time with that I still am pretty like foggy on. <laughs> I think I feel similarly. On <laughs> <laughs> exactly what's uh, Austrian when when is it the uh, Austrian Empire? When is it the Austro-Hungarian Empire? Yes. When is it the Habsburg Empire? When is it the German Confederation? Holy Roman Empire. When is it the Holy Roman Empire? Yeah. And sometimes it's all those things. Yeah. At once. yeah. And when is it just Mahler's backyard? <laughs> and all all yes. sorts of questions that we will yes. cover today. Yes, definitely. Um, so, um, yeah, Julian, uh, why don't we just give you a little bit of a, of a chance to say... Um, if we could kind of, so Wagner, we're coming at it from a Wagner perspective, mm -hmm. which generally puts us from like 1810 to like 1880. Yeah. Um, so your work and your focus, where has that, um, so 1810 to 1880 for Wagner, but also in like German mm -hmm. kind of, um, maybe even Swiss Italian areas. Yeah. So your work, if you could kind of um, give us a place and a time so that we can kind of see where we meet. Yeah, so my work uh, focuses mostly between about 1848, so like the liberal revolutions, mm -hmm. um, to, I think I sort of started 1848, um, but really for me the, the full swing of things is like around the 1870s, um, and then I kind of conclude where I'm looking, especially in like my thesis I wrote on the Salzburg Festival um, shortly before the Anschluss, so um, in 1930, yeah, 1938. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of like the broad stroke. So you have um, like Austria becoming uh, transitioning sort of from this like absolutist state to like a liberal one um, in the 1860s and 1870s after the liberal revolutions. And then, um, of course, by 1938, there is no Austrian Empire, um, of, of course, and there's the rise of um, you know, the Third Reich. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, your cultural focus, what kind of, is it mostly um, sociopolitical? Is it cultural? Is it musical, theater, literary? Yeah, I think for me it's cultural, um, but I think sort of seeing the cultural elements as uh, sociopolitical um, in a lot okay. of different ways. So the culture is reflecting um, 
in many ways uh, what people are concerned about and are thinking about um, in the empire at this time, um, especially sure. amongst the um, aristocratic elites, but also among the growing uh, middle classes, which are mm -hmm. really potent, important forces mm -hmm. um, in the Austrian Empire at that time. Hmm. Could, could we back things up and kind of give, just give a broad scale timeline of the Austrian Empire or this yeah. polity, which has many different names in different times? Yes. So maybe, I don't know what would be a good starting date, I'm thinking something before 1500 actually, if like yes. the Holy Roman Empire. I mean, the, you, you can start then. Um, I mean, really what, what becomes the Austrian Empire, we're, we're talking about like, um, first, the pers essentially what is the personal fiefdom of the Habsburg family. Okay. So it's, um, it's their sort of hereditary lands. Um, and that is sort of the status of the um, Austrian Empire for a lot of like the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. Um, but then uh, starting, I believe, in the mid 16th century, uh, members of the Habsburg family start being elected Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and this uh, shakes up, of course, under Maria Theresa because um, Salic law dictates that a woman cannot uh, be elected Holy Roman Emperor. Um, but really, like that title of like Austrian or has Maria Theresa being a member of the Habsburg family. Yes, yes. So Maria Theresa was a member of the Habsburg family. Um, her father was the emperor. He had only daughters. Um, and uh, he wrote a pact, um, essentially like agreeing that upon his death, the crown would pass to his oldest daughter, who was Maria Theresa. There was a very large war fought of, um, over this, which was the War of the Austrian Succession in the 1740s. Okay. Um, and uh, Frederick the Great, of course, uh, tried to take, um, was not very thrilled that Maria Theresa was inheriting and tried to uh, mm -hmm. take uh, lands from her, most famously Silesia, which was a really like wealthy and like prosperous part I've been there. Of, the of the empire at that time. <laughs> yeah. Shazhova, yeah. shout out right now. Shazhova <laughs> Music Festival in what is currently Poland in Silesia. Yeah. The old estate of the Pan Molka. Yeah. The Molka estate, the guy who won the Bank of Prussian where he got this land as a prize for winning the money. The Molka estate. Yeah. There's a fantastic music festival there happening right now, which I took part in for two years. Oh, uh, wow. So shout yeah. out Silesia yeah. and Shizhova. Yeah. All right. But it, it starts to look like the, the modern empire that we really start to think of. Um, that starts to come into place sort of under Maria Theresa. Um, so she is uh, broadly concerned with like educational reforms, with cultural reforms. So she's the first person that institutes like public schooling, for example, like in the mm -hmm. empire for both men and women. Um, uh, and uh, her son, uh, Joseph, uh, like continues these sorts of reforms, but the state that they're creating at that time is a pretty heavily like centralized one. Um, and this really like uh, comes into like full fruition once the Holy, Holy Roman Empire collapses in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. And once that stops existing sort of as a state, um, the Habsburgs can no longer sort of derive their clout, so to speak, from mm -hmm. like being Holy Roman, Holy, Holy Roman Emperor. Um, they have to find it in other places. Um, and so they start to look inwardly um, in all of these lands that have sort of been patched together um, from various like annexations or sort of like various personal possessions. Those personal possessions, they start to think, well, how do we build a state mm -hmm. out of the personal mm -hmm. possessions, these like hereditary lands that we once held? And can you tell us about that collapse of the Holy Roman Empire, changing from the Holy Roman Empire to the Habsburg Empire, or Austro-Hungarian Empire, and, and what term do you think fits it best at that point? Um, I think, well, I mean, uh, someone who's been really influential on me in thinking about this um, is this historian named Peter Judson. He wrote a book, um, I think in 2000, yeah, I think it was like 2016, uh, called The Habsburg Empire, um, A New History. Um, and in this book, uh, he decides to sort of to refer to this entire thing that he starts talking about around the time of Maria Theresa through its collapse as the Habsburg Empire, even though it starts to take these different names and like different forms. So I think Habsburg Empire is a useful term um, for it because I think it emphasizes that this really is like a family project and kind of what holds it together is the fact that it's kind of under this um, like central monarch um, or like central figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, but like upon the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire, um, I mean, upon the collapse of the Holy, Ro really, Holy Roman Empire, um, and what caused the collapse? Uh, I, I mean, I mean, in, in sorry, 
Oh boy. Got <laughs> refreshments. Uh, it's of course uh, Napoleon among a lot of other uh, things. Right? That's the impression I have. Yes, I mean it's Napoleon among. And this um, is during Beethoven's life. Oh yes, yeah, this yeah. is during Beethoven's lifetime. So it's Napoleon among um, a host of different factors, but Napoleon really upsets that traditional order that had been set in Europe, right? Um, so uh, there's right at the and there is a balance of power, so to speak, that exists in Europe. Um, and it's governed by these um, absolutist monarchs, even if they are enlightened. So, right, Maria Theresa is one of these enlightened mar monarchs, as is Frederick of Prussia. Um, but they're still uh, absolute rulers, in a sense, right? There, there isn't a mm -hmm. parliamentary system. There, aren't, there isn't really liberal mm -hmm. uh, government institutions that we would think about today. Um, but Napoleon upsets that one by, um, in his conquest, like introducing um, like civil codes and, and, and reforms uh, and reforming the ways that cities are organized, reforming laws, like all of these different things. Um, and something like the Holy Roman Empire, which was really, I mean, by the 1800s is like a survival of kind of a, a it's, it's a medieval state because it's not even centrally governed really in a real way, right? It's governed by mm -hmm. like a council made up of all of the different rulers of the different states that make up the empire, right? And they get together and they elect this person. But um, other than like the places that are directly controlled by the Holy Roman Empire, they're all sort of independent states of their own that have their different like legal systems and like traditions. Some of them are Catholic, some of them are Protestant. Um, some of them, uh, oh, really? yeah, I mean, some of them are, are more tolerant, some of them are less tolerant, right? But they could all still be under the... Well, but they're sort of all under this, 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 this patchwork, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can't really run a patchwork state um, after someone like Napoleon has kind of shown that, uh, that a new <laughs> model of statecraft is possible, mm -hmm. right? And so the Habsburgs, in the collapse of the empire, attempt to hold on to these ideas, right? And they really, um, they, they, they start a trail, um, especially under like Metternich, of uh, like intense centralization uh, with, uh, late, as the Industrial Revolution goes on, um, like the building of railroads and things like that. This is after Metternich is gone by this point. Um, he, he leaves uh, as a result of the liberal revolutions in 1848. That's what really kicks him out. Um, but before that, you know, they are embarking upon like these railroads and like these economic plans and things like that. Um, but uh, there are nationalist forces that start to brew as well, right? And because we're, we're, we're starting to get into the Romantic era. Um, and so uh, various people groups that exist within this empire, it's not a nation state in any in contemporary any sense. sense. Right. It's, it's um, made up of people who are, are, are Czechs or, 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 or Polish. Um, uh, various uh, like Jewish groups within the empire as well, Hungarians, um, and then people who are, I guess, amorphously referred to as Germans or Austrians. And um, Italians as well. And, and Italians, I mean, all sorts of different people, right. several uh, Croatian people um, of many different religions, Catholics, Protestants, um, Lutheran Protestants, Calvinists, um, uh, Jews, as well as Muslims. I mean, there, there are people just really from all over the mm -hmm. world. I mean, because you have an empire literally that is spanning from what's now Switzerland um, and then bordering um, Italy, right? And like rules Venice and like Milan at this time. Um, I mean, all the way to, I mean, parts of what is now Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have this, a very large state that is made up of all these different kinds of people. Right. Yeah, it seems, um, it seems as we were kind of thinking about like the difference between German and Austrian things, mm -hmm. um, that the Austria and the concept of what it means to be Austrian mm -hmm. seems to be much more cosmopolitan mm -hmm. than German. Mm -hmm. And when somebody like Wagner starts making more and more appeals to um, Germanness and yes, this kind yes, of like yeah. Teutonic heritage, yeah, um, he has a much more uh, religiously and racially confined, oh, and yeah. ethnically confined, or limited view oh, of, yes. of what of what what's included in that group. Yes, and the Austrian view is like you said, like multilingual, multinational yeah. in a lot more ways. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's multinational and multilingual, kind of united on, um, under this single imperial figure. Mm -hmm. So the emperor, um, even the funny thing is, even during the liberal revolutions in eighteen forty eight. 
um, by and large, the nationalist groups were not concerned with getting rid of the emperor, um, mm. with the, or, or even leaving the empire necessarily. These are not secessionist movements that comes much later on that this language starts to be used. They actually see um, themselves as kind of united under this figure, um, and like therefore, kind of as almost like imperial, you know, children, so to speak. They have the rights. Um, they, they they should have sort of a certain like amount of rights and dignity mm -hmm. um, and recognition. Uh, but I think what you see is German kind of becomes uh, it, it it is used at various times in the empire um, under Joseph II, who was Maria Theresa's son, um, but also. Um, uh, but also sort of like under the neo-absolutist regime that rises under Franz Josef, who's emperor, um, starting in 1848, right till, you know, pretty much on the, on the doorstep of the, um, of the doorstep of the end of the First World War. He's, you know, emperor for a very long time. But under his reign, um, at the beginning part of it, you also see German used as kind of like this common lingua franca mm -hmm. um, for administrative reason, uh, for administrative, yeah, reasons across the empire. But then a lot of local business is still done in like sure, local sure, languages, sure. right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so I think German is a much more porous category, and you even see in some of the the like um, papers and like uh, and, and in other things of the time, people who speak German who are sort of ethnically um, Czech or Hungarian being referred to as Germans by the mm -hmm. nationalists because mm -hmm. they are these German-speaking people who have this German culture. Right. right, right. Um, so. In the Austrian Empire, the, the German speakers were really referred to as, um, in, in the Habsburg Empire, I should say, they're referred to as like the Staatsvolk, you know, the state people. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, they're kind of supposed to be this neutral group, mm -hmm. you know, this sort of neutral group um, that isn't necessarily ethnically aligned. Mm -hmm. Though, of course, we're talking about like this huge empire over a lot of periods of time and this changes. Sure, sure. Right? Like Brussels. Yeah, yeah, a little, a little bit, maybe a little bit like that. I mean, you're, you're kind of dealing with something that is not too dissimilar from the EU in the sense of, I mean, it is much more centralized, but you are dealing with like something that is incredibly multinational. And I think that gets, I think that actually gets really um, to the heart of like the, the squabbles and the fighting among yeah. people yeah. Um, is the fact that it is so many different, you know, sort of people groups under one. Right. Yeah, thing. Um, this is sort of a sideline, and I don't want to get mm -hmm. too into it, but I was wondering, this is driving over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there today any sense of fraternality from the states that used to be part of the Habsburg Empire? That's, I think that's a very difficult question um, because there are people who would say yes, and I think there are people who would say no. So there's, there's kind of this idea of like Middle Europa, of like, you know, Middle Europe, Central Europe, um, of the countries that were formerly ruled by the Habsburgs. Um, but I think it can be felt that that particular framing of fraternality really depends um, on like either like the German language or like sort of German speaking culture more broadly or also like the legacy of like imperialism, right? So. Which could be taken many different ways. Well, it can be taken in a lot of different ways. I mean, I think also the more positive forms of nationalism as a project amongst uh, amongst uh, like these minority groups or or, or yeah the, these minority groups in the empire like really changes over its history. So you find by the very end of the Habsburg Empire in 1918 um, an intense hostility to like the emperor to these imperial mm -hmm. institutions, um, to um, like the German language, to education in the German language, all of these different things. Um, and, and I think a lot less of like the mixing. I mean, also post-war Europe is um, a lot sort of neater, so to speak, and where people live, right? So there were lots of different groups of people that were sort of dispersed mm -hmm. throughout, you know, Central Europe, who um, as a legacy of the war, like now sort of only live in like one place so there you don't really find like czech speakers for example and like somewhere that may have at one point been like austria or ukrainian speakers kind of scattered around places that might have been like near poland or something like that at one time or german speakers and like you know the czech republic or something like that that that's just that doesn't exist so mm -hmm. there isn't a lot more there isn't the cultural mixing that you had before mm -hmm. lines were a lot sharper 
Stefan Zweig wrote about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Milan Kundra also writes about this, and I mean, he's he's pretty hostile to the idea of like a middle Europa that kind of unites all of these people. He sort of sees that as a a very kind of German idea, maybe a German idea in the um, like Central European context, as opposed to somewhere that is like you know what we think of as Germany proper. But he sees it as very uniquely kind of a German language thing. Um, so one of the, I think that there's two storylines here, yeah. or, or important ideas. One is about, I forget if it's Fichte or Herder, I get them mixed mm-hmm. up, about language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of dictating what is a nation and the destiny of that nation. And that idea is very important for Wagner. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, and it's very important for what happens with Germany and Yeah, Herder is, is very into this. And then the... The second one is just, uh, you know, like what is the relationship or, or um, the storyline of how Germany became Germany? Because mm-hmm. that wasn't a clear cut, foregone conclusion by any means. So um, maybe you could speak to those two mm-hmm. ideas. Or one's more of an idea and the other one's kind of a storyline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that. Yeah, this this is a particularly powerful idea for um, for Herder as is the person who really um, identifies um, nation with language, um, and I think this I think this has to do kind of with um, hmm, language being seen as an intimate way in which one relates to the world. So that language that is spoken as containing um, it's not just sort of uh, for like the the everyday use, or, or even because it is kind of the everyday use, it's it's um like almost like in a phenomenological sense, it's kind of what allows a person like access to the world, um and like being able to understand it. So the languages and the languages that people speak, I think for both German nationalists, but for you know Czech nationalists, Hungarian, Ukrainian nationalists, all sorts of different groups at this time, it is like a, a really potent and important idea. Um, and then you see like the cultivation right of like a national literature of okay um, if we don't have sort of great works in our own language right now then we need to write these works right. or ethnomusicology um, yes or ethnomusicology I mean absolutely Kodai, right Kodai, Bartok yes yes it's, it's, it is the same thing yeah. yeah it's that you know we need to create the great works um, of our people and I think that and especially the German speaking context this is important for those groups because they sort of see um, music or literature as being dominated by Germans, Germans right? Um, and you have these German figures, and we need sort of our own figures, you know, these, these groups that um, feel that they are at the periphery, right, and often are still even in music history today, um, feel like they need to be, you know, have access. Um, the formation of Germany um, is... I think related, I think, to this idea that we were talking about earlier of at the collapse of the, um, up at the collapse of the Habsburg Empire and, yeah, at the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, there is no, I'm sorry, not the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, at the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire, there is no... Which is 1800... This is, oh nine, gosh, like, yeah, 18, something. yeah, something like that. Right. Um, it may even be a bit earlier because of when Napoleon invades, but um, like around that time, mm-hmm. prior to that, there there are no sort of unified like German. There there isn't like a unified kind of like German um, nation. There are a bunch of these different states, um, some of which uh, probably on the grounds among common people do not speak a language that we would necessarily immediately recognize as like standard German okay. today, right? So there there's a lot of like regional variations. This is different, I think, in literature, right? I think in literature, um, the language really refers to someone like, like people like Goethe or Schiller, um, these like, you know, august literary figures, mm-hmm. and that's what the basis of the language comes from. But on the ground, I mean, from, you know, north, from somewhere like Hamburg to like um, Cologne to uh, Munich or, or Berlin, all of these different places, these are like center, centers of German culture. Um, and, or Leipzig, you know, for that matter. Um, these are sermons, centers of German culture and society, but 
the language um, and the character of the regions is just like intensely different um, in all of those different places. Yeah, I mean, even even being in Switzerland now, yes, like you really come face to face with the difference between an accent and a dialect. Oh yes, where in the U.S. you yes. have a lot of different accents. Yes, but over there it's like okay, vocabulary, yes. sentence structure, yes, yes, yeah, the whole thing, like to the point where you have trouble understanding each other. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it, I, I was, from my, from my personal experience, I was surprised at just yeah. how big the difference actually is. Yeah. yeah to the absolutely. point of not understanding what the no. heck someone's saying. No, I mean, it's, it's, it, it really is true that it can be sort of different to the point of being like absolutely mm -hmm. unintelligible. Um, and I mean, first, what you would, so the, the, the project of, of, of German nationalism, and I think that this is true of um, a lot of the nationalist projects, at least, that are going on in the Habsburg Empire, which I feel more familiar with, um, they are in some ways kind of uh, top-down. So they are trying to foster feelings of like nationality amongst the people, right? But the like standardization of, like the, the, the people are not speaking sort of like the German language, right? Um, and that like feeling of like Germanness is being cultivated through um, like either like music or um, literature, but it's being sort of cultivated among um, either like aristocratic elites or among like the like sort of like growing like urban middle classes and like bourgeois elites, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you sort of get this formation, I believe, in the like aftermath of the Holy Roman Empire of like this sort of North German confederation. Um, which kind of attempts to create um, some common like uh, economic policies, like like customs, um, and I think there are also some like legal things that are attached to that amongst um, the various like German speaking areas, you know, um, and of course what is like. Um, what goes on to become Germany when it is unified um, in 1861 is larger than what it is today. So it includes parts of what's now um, Poland or even, you know, Russia. Silesia. Um, yeah, yeah and, and Silesia, right? Mm -hmm. So you have these, so you have like a, this, this, this region that is kind of still like very loosely, um, very loosely associated. Um, and then with like the actual formation of something like the like German Empire, um, you have a bunch of, it, it's, it's in, in an interesting way, they use some of the like existing political units that came from the Holy Roman Empire, right? So like Bavaria is its own independent kingdom, right? Until it becomes part of the uh, German Empire or like Prussia is its own independent kingdom, right? Or there are these various um, like uh, small duchies and uh, different places or like principalities, but those those are kind of retained, right? But they are all incorporated in sort of like this, this um, federated structure. So you kind of get something that is not, I, this is not really the proper comparison, but I think in a loose sense, you get something that's almost, if like the, if the Habsburg Empire is much more like um, the European Union, so to speak, of Europe, you get something that is much more like the US in the sense of, mm -hmm. Here are a bunch of like different places that are kind of all under like this federal structure. That doesn't mean they all have the same amount of power or influence within it. You know, this is very much a Prussian affair, right? right. And that that's right. The, the the unification of Germany is something that is um, is led from the north because the northern Germans and the southern Ger so the the northern Germans sort of represented by the Prussians and the southern Germans really represented by. Austria are kind of in competition for who should be the real Germany. Right. They have sort of a scrum. Yes. Over yes. And they fight wars um, There's sort of about a, this. The impression I have from my scant study of this history yeah. is that there was this inevitable sense mm -hmm. that there would be a German nation mm -hmm. defined by language. And the question was how it would happen mm -hmm. and who would have kind of control over the, what would the identity of that nature be? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then also the countries, other than, uh, you know, France, everybody mm -hmm. else was afraid of there being a unified German nation. They were trying to do what they could to put the oh, brakes yes. on that. Yeah. Um, and rightfully so. I mean, Germany caused a lot of wars right after mm -hmm. it became a big mm -hmm. independent nation. Um, 
With friends, of course, as well, yeah. right, immediately, right? Right, yeah. you drank a Prussian wine. Yeah. Um, right, so you have Austria and Germany, well, Prussia, I suppose, mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of fighting over the inner German lands, and mm -hmm. eventually the German nation comes out on the other side. Yes. In 1861? Yes. That's yeah, so in 1861 you have um, the unification of Germany, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. And that's when Bavaria folds? I think Bavaria, yeah, I, yeah, I believe Bavaria is folded into the empire by that time. Okay. It may have some separate rights still into the. Lithuania still had a lot of power and yes. money. Yes. Yes, it may still have some separate um, rights and powers into the eighteen seventies, mm -hmm. but certainly by that time it is part of, okay. of like this German empire. I mean, so there are. That's the that's the funny thing about it is that there are monarchs, so to speak under the like German emperors so you sort of have these like regional dukes and and like princes and you know kings even in some way like right. you even have uh, Bavaria. Frederick the Great right yeah he's king but the guy who really has power is Bismarck yeah he's the prime minister well well yeah 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 and yeah. you also have a Reichstag like a yeah parliament. yeah there's a part yeah I mean there's there, there there's a parliament and I think that um, it also is I think a state that is trying to figure out um, what direction it's heading in. So it's trying to figure out, is it going to become, um, and I think this is true of, of, of many states in Europe, and, but it's trying to figure out, is it going to sort of move on like a neo-absolutist sort of um, track, right? Is it going to try and like very heavily centralize and have a lot of top-down control? Or is it going to try and become, um, is it going to try and become uh, one of these like sort of liberally minded uh, states, right? Which um, did it end up as? Well, uh, in some ways because of an accident of, in, in, in some ways, I wouldn't say quite an accident of history, but um, I believe the second, I want to say it is the second German emperor. I would have to check myself on that. But I think that the second German emperor who is I want to say it is Wilhelm. There are Wilhelms and there are Fredericks. Um, <laughs> yes, it's one of the two. Um, yes, but uh, he dies, right? So he, he is the heir. He succeeds to the throne. He is in charge for not very long. He dies, and he is very liberally minded. Uh -huh. His brother succeeds to the throne and ends up being emperor sort of during you know, the time of like the lead up to the First World War, right. and he is much more absolutist-minded. Okay. And so you have a transition from... Um, and then after that guy was Kaiser Bill. Yes, okay. yeah. And so you have a transition from, like, um, what could have been perhaps a Germany that uh, was moving towards, like, liberal reforms uh, to one that, like, ends up going down sort of this, like, very sort of absolutist, centralized kind of track. Yeah, it's funny. I um, th th there's kind of two contradictory or e maybe even paradoxical things that mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. happen at the same time. But mm -hmm. on one hand, we have this like hypersensitivity to um, your own individual identity, mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, I'm not an American. I'm from Maryland. I'm from Baltimore. I'm from Towson. Mm -hmm. It's like, and yes. I try and like cultivate that like hyper local yes what are the dialects what are the foods what are the and i try and build my identity around that yes. but at the yeah. same time there's also these much wider appeals to like nationhood and mm -hmm. um these like pan-germanic leagues or like mm -hmm. um, yeah. this very cosmopolitan thing and i i find similar contradictions aesthetically in um music by even starting with Beethoven, with mm -hmm. famously like the Beethoven Nine, which has some pretty explicit claims to yeah. universality yes. in the text yeah. of the Fourth oh, Amendment. Yes. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I don't know how far Beethoven's mind was like mm -hmm. reaching, but I think it's safe to say he wasn't like thinking about Australia. Yes, when yeah. he was talking about like his yes. universality, yes, exactly. yeah. you know. But <laughs> well, what is the universal humanity um, that's being talked about? Here? Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. So there's these kinds of um, conflicts here, and I think we also really well, get this, has in... this issue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And our our good friend yeah. Wagner, 
yes. yeah. also had this issue. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, where the, there's this kind of this conflict of universality, but for a specific audience. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like it's universal, but not for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think uh, it's it's kind of hearing you talk about these kinds of uh, different appeals to either personal identity, but also um, the structure of government. Yes. Um, and how there's also kind of some sympathetic resonance with kind of the same problems and contradictions that we find in this aesthetic. Um, oh, thing. I mean, absolutely. And uh, yeah. in your um, in your undergraduate dissertation, you talk about you kind of compare and contrast the Bayreuth with mm -hmm. the Salzburg Festival, mm -hmm. and keeping those kinds of um, paradoxes in mind, mm -hmm. contradictions in mind of like universality mm -hmm. versus like mm -hmm. like. Um, sensitivity to yes. local identity um yeah if you could kind of talk a little bit about the that kind of austrian mentality versus that german mentality and how it plays out in the in the kind of home stadium of wagner and the home stadium of somebody like strauss or oh, yeah. mozart yeah um so i kind of gave you a lot of possible starting points there. No, 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 no. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I feel like I have sort of more things to say than I'm like immediately yeah, of course. able to. Um, there is this idea in the late 18th century. And so, you know, the late 18th century is a really important time in um, sort of cultural history in the German world. And I guess I should say when I use German, I, I kind of mean anyone who speaks the German language and interacts with cultural forms produced by people who use the German language. Mm -hmm. um, so this, at this time, includes, you know, this this would include, like, later on, someone like Mendelssohn, right? Even right. though there would be peop people, right. certainly, in contemporary German society, broadly read, would not see him as German because he was Jewish. Um, so there is this idea of, um, of Weltbürgerlichkeit, so kind of like being a world citizen. And... Um, that idea of being uh, a world citizen is kind of seen as, okay, it's, it's, it is that universal humanity, right? Mm -hmm. But it's that universal humanity kind of through the German lens, right? Sure. And in some sense, um, to, I, I don't think it is too bold necessarily to claim that in some sense to um, be sort of a cultural, uh, like a cultured, educated um, German at this time of 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 Goethe and 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 and, and Schiller, um, was sort of to be to see oneself as a world citizen. Mm -hmm. for that this reason, is the, right? the Goethe sites. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, it was it was sort of to see oneself as a as as a world citizen, and that um, one sort of uh, participation in like German cultural forms is sort of what made one a world citizen right. because the Germans were the were the ones, and in, in this person's view it would be that the Germans were the ones who were thinking about this idea of right. universal humanity, universal culture. Right. Now, I think in the Austrian and the, um, and, and sort of like the, the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg kind of context, and in the um, German context, I mean, this plays itself out differently because, and, and I mean, really we're jumping around um, to like a very different time from the Goethe side, right? So um, we're, we're going from the late 18, the, the late um, 18th century, right? So from the 1790s um, or, you know, around like uh, 1800, right? Um, um Achsenhundert is this phrase that gets used a lot to describe this time in, 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 in like German history, you know, sort of around 1800. That we're now jumping to um, like the age of Wagner and like the middle um, 1840s through like the yeah. 1870s. Post 1848. Yeah, post or 1848, right? right. And then uh, we're talking about someone like Strauss who was born, I believe, at the end of Wagner's life or maybe even after he's dead, um, to like then the, I mean, the like period that like the 1920s, right? So I mean, mm -hmm. these are these are periods that are in conversation with one another, but are also, historically speaking, like really... Of course, of course. ...far away from one yeah. another. Um, so, with someone like Wagner, um, I guess the, 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 the easiest way, I guess, like to zero in on it is, right, you have like, um, you, you have uh, these like German sort of uh, 
romantic operas, right? So you have like something like Lohengrin, right? Or you have um, uh, Tristan, but of course you have like The Ring, right? And Parsifal. And these works um, are all ones that refer to uh, Germanic mythology. Probably, right. Right, yeah, they right. get back to your what you were talking about earlier. Yeah, creating the masterworks yeah. oh, of yeah. our people. Yeah, it's right. it's it's taking you know um, a poem that was that was known, but um, perhaps not. It's it's taking something and it is claiming it as the um, statement of what it means mm-hmm. to be, you know, German, right? And it's actually pretty funny that like yeah, outside of Bayreuth, maybe one of the main yeah places that gets. The most press for the ring is what, probably the Met. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. just how, how like worldwide it yes. is, and like is that, at what point is that outside of Wagner's vision for the work? Yes. For like what the work oh, was yeah. for. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, Parsifal's the classic one there because that was that was the big yeah, play. Yeah, that was for my work. Uh, the ring could be yeah. played anywhere, but Wagner said only Parsifal, right? Only yeah. at Bayreuth, right. and his family fought pretty hard for that. Mm-hmm. And the Met, they were the first place to perform Parsifal, mm-hmm. other than at Bayreuth. There you mm-hmm. go. So that was, um, yeah. So my, my impression of the, like Wagner's project, of course it changed. He was a yeah. lot more resigned and sanguine at the end of his life. But post-1848 Wagner, and like pretty shortly after yes. his activity and his exile, because of those revolutions, he has the idea for the ring. Mm-hmm. And that his idea is... Uh, religious in ambition that he's going to you know, create something that's artistic that can kind of stand mm-hmm. in place for a uh, have a religious oh, significance yeah. and power for a German nation. Yes, exactly. And that he'll go to Germanic sources, not Christian sources. Yes, yes, yes. But go to Germanic sources to create that. Yes, and I think that this is something that people get wrong about Wagner quite often is that um, I think he gets spoken about in this. I, th- I think you're absolutely correct, but I think that he often gets spoken about as this deeply sort of. I think people see something like Parsifal and they see, ah, uh, you know, it's about the Holy Grail, or you know, they see the like sort of Catholic like backdrop of something like Lohengrin, right? And they and they think, ah, uh, you know, these are like deeply religious works that are about, you know, I don't know, faith or or or, or something that we would think of as like. Um, Christian religious faith today, and they're, I mean, they're, they're really not. I mean, that, mm-hmm. and in a lot of ways, you know, he's inspired by, um, he, he's inspired by uh, uh, Schopenhauer, right, as, as, as seeing sort of um, art as a way of dealing with um, sort of the um, pervasive kind of like, uh, like oppressiveness of the world, right? Like of, of like talking about like the you know this like will that sort of everyone is subject to, mm-hmm. um, and that um, it's like uncaring and unloving, but is sort of absolute, right? Um, and that sort of uh, affects the way that one uh, lives one's life. Uh, but like he he's really interested, I think, in seeing the art that he's producing as like superseding um, like religion uh as it as as it exists right? yeah, i feel like if he, he's more interested in religion not as a christian no but yeah. as a as a sort of cultural artifact yes yes yeah and he wants to center this cultural artifact as one of the foundational bricks or whatever of of what he eventually sees i, as I think roger folk screwed and put it really well saying that wagner believed in the, like the essentialness and necessity of the religious experience. The yes, experience yes, of the, the sacred. Experience, yes. But he did not believe in the claims of the church or dogma no. or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And that his music, you know, he wanted to create yes. that experience of the sacred. Oh yeah. I mean, that's why, right, you, you go into Bayreuth and you have it's not like these other houses, right? That the lights are going to come down, and that was something that did not occur necessarily when one went to the opera. That one went to the opera to see other people and to mm-hmm. speak with them and to, right. you know, sort of chat. And this, you know, and then we get the showstopper aria, and then everyone sort of looks at the stage. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a social affair, right? But it it is it's like I mean, going to the, a, a movie theater in the sense that you know the lights come down and you're you're looking at this sort of like mesmerizing show that's going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Zosberg um, is very much not interested in the sort of 
religious experience kind of mm. thing as Wagner is interested in it. Mm. Um, that is because I think that's for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I guess to narrow in on a few. One, um, Richard Strauss, who is involved with the creation, you, you have like three people who are there when Salzburg really takes off. You and have, when does it take off? So Salzburg um, is founded in 1920. Okay, so that's um, 50 years yeah, so this is, after Bayreuth. Yeah, so this is after Very Bayreuth, long. right? And this is after the collapse of the Habsburg Empire. Right, so right there, after the end of World yes, War Yes, so there is no Habsburg Empire in 1920, right? That had, it had, you know, it collapsed two years prior, but they had been talking about founding this festival for about three or five years before that, so when there still was this empire. Um, but, uh, and, and they were talking about, essentially, we want something that um, celebrates kind of the unique um, multiculturalism, the, the field for Kostas, right, the many people state mm -hmm. of the um, Habsburg Empire, and then in its collapse, it's sort of a bit of a tribute, so to speak, to the empire itself and to the cosmopolitan perspective that it has, right? Um, how, how, um, is it more nostalgic as like a preservation thing or is it more of a continuation thing? I think that is the... If that difference is worth being made. No, no, I think it is. And I think that this is the question that I am like seeking to answer and I think a lot about. Um, it seems overwhelmingly very nostalgic in the sense that it's kind of looking... It's... It's um, it's very much disaffected with the current political mm. situation, right? Okay. Because I think there is a way in which, um, we, for good and bad reasons, um, I think many, often for good reasons, prefer empires to republics as states. But just because you have the republican states of the post World War One period does not necessarily mean that mm -hmm. these are not states that. There is the force of like ethnic nationalism, right? And I think ethnic nationalism um, is capable of being incredibly racist and anti-Semitic as a political force, certainly at this time, right? right. And so uh, you have like the involvement um, at Salzburg um, of people who have Jewish backgrounds. So Hugo von Hofmannsthal, who worked very closely with Strauss, um, was of Jewish heritage, though his family had converted to Roman Catholicism um, decades prior to that. Um, but you also have Max Reinhardt, who was born to an Orthodox Jewish family mm. um, and was um, sort of a, a secular Jew and saw himself as that. Um, so I think that there was a real concern that um, somewhere like, I don't think it's too much to say that someone like, somewhere like Bayreuth could feel um, provincial in their minds uh, that it was just very much fascinated with this idea of germanness mm -hmm. um but also uh could be um so provincial not in the sense that it literally is just a pretty small german well i think both village, i think I but think also both. just because it's germanness in a sense is kind of smaller than austrianness yes yes <laughs> well because i think austrianness can encompass that right i have two degrees of separation or one degree mm -hmm. Pianist and this other guy. Mm -hmm. The other guy uh, plays in the orchestra of Bayreuth, uh -huh. and apparently he described it as, "Well, this podoc town, and then for a couple yeah. weeks in the summer, you get like the the richest yeah. people in Europe yeah. plus the the guys you saw raiding the capital and the like, <laughs> <and Helmut. laughs> like, like the, the the January sixth delegation. Yeah, doing the Comic Con <laughs> cosplay uh, yeah. of oh the racing cost. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's, I mean, sort of a Bayreuth, I think in the, so Max Reinhardt, I guess I should talk a little bit about like all of these people. Like Max Reinhardt was a very, very, very important German director. He's like probably the father of German expressionism, like the cinematic movement. Mm -hmm. um, he like directed plays um, in... Uh, mostly in Berlin, actually. So that's where a lot of his work is going. He has a, his own sort of house there, and he's playing, like, um, dramas by Schiller, Shakespeare. Um, he's playing things by, by, by Goethe. He's playing uh, contemporary things. Um, people like Konstantin Stanislavski um, are going to see the things that he's putting on, you know, who is, like, the father of, like, modern acting theory. Like, he is an important person, um, and he has quite a lot of cultural pull, even though he gets to start in, in Vienna, you know, most of his work's done in Berlin. Mm. Um, 
and uh, but but nonetheless, he's he's interested sort of in and he's one of the founders. Yes, of the I think he he's interested in sort of bringing to Vienna, um, uh, well, sort of bringing to uh, Vienna, and of course Salzburg is not in Vienna, but sort of bringing to like Vienna and later to this idea of bringing it to Salzburg, um, like the high cultural things that are going on in. In, in Berlin, right? Because Berlin really is sort of the, the beating heart of like cultural sophistication and the avant-garde and the German speaking world mm -hmm. that is like um, in a truly globalized sense. You know, there is More culture. So there is culture certainly happening in Vienna, right? There's there is the secession, um, there um, there is uh, Mahler, there is like the um, Brahms is carrying the torch there. Yeah, there, there's the second Viennese school, right? There there are there are things that are going on in Vienna, but um, Berlin, there's there, there's there there are things like cabaret, right? There there is kind of like modern, mm -hmm. um, popular culture and sort of like culture that uh, other people around the world are looking at, right? Yeah. You know, um, it's it it survives it, its cultural prestige really survives the war, whereas somewhere like Vienna, in the mind of the Viennese, um, and perhaps even to the mind of the world feels hollowed out by the war, right? Mm -hmm. That it, a lot of sort of what made Austria really f starts to feel like it's, it, it, it internally, and you see this in kind of novels um, that are written kind of after, there, most famously there's, there, there's, a, there's a novel called The Superhof Steps, right? That talks about um, Austria that's written long after this period, but sort of is like a retrospective looking at it. Um, and you find kind of in like, in, in either like novels or cultural production, a certain amount of like wow we just sort of live in this rump state now that you know we had this empire and now it's gone and how do we cope with that it's so like reinhardt's trying to bring real culture to you know Salzburg. back to austria yeah. right and then um well it's funny yeah. in your in your paper you talk yeah. about um like for from the outside salzburg yeah. probably the first way that i heard about this yeah. is this is where mozart's from yeah and this is where he lived yeah and uh, there's the Mozarteum, yeah. So named after Mozart. Yeah. Um, I don't know that when that's founded, but it's also uh, in reading your your paper, you talk about the, how there was a very very conscious effort, mm -hmm. or deliberate even effort to kind of, mm -hmm. I mean not claim but just like recenter Mozart or put Mozart back in the center. Oh of, yes. Of Austrian cultural activities, um, and specifically this festival. Yes, um, as that, that that would be kind of like the 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 ember that would yes, never absolutely. go out, you know, of this festival. Yeah, the cultural I, effort. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are some like there 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 are a lot of different reasons for that. I think there's um, there, there's the fact that Mozart is really a perfect foil to someone like Wagner, um, mm. because Mozart is just not right. Wagner, you're talking about someone who has sort of theorized in great detail about what he is doing culturally, oh, yeah. um, like writes long essays about this, like has a whole concept for the kinds of works he wants to produce, builds his own house dedicated to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, Mozart is, I think, much lighter to the touch, so to speak. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's you, you, have this, right, you have these, like, you have these silly marriage comedies where people are doing you know, <laughs> outlandish things to one another and chasing each other around or, you know, dressing up and pretending to be other people, right? right, right, right. Like, you, you hey, have someone... Like, does that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is true. What that's are you talking true. about? Yes, that's true. Like, that's true. Yeah. Marriage comedy? <laughs> yeah, <go. laughs> yeah, a marriage drama. <laughs> Apparently that's what the new production of Bio is trying to emphasize this year. Uh, did you see that thing? <laughs> no, I don't think I did. Have you heard about this? <laughs> yeah. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, let's not, let's not, yeah, that's okay. for our, that's for our another, other, another podcast. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, but, you know. Getting back to Mozart. The, the like, ring like is not Noche, and it's not, you know, cozy, it's not sort of s silly in that kind right. of way, right? Um, and, I mean, funny enough, like, they, the, and I mean, those are the sorts of works that they, they, they put on, right? Or mm -hmm. these ones that, I mean, yes, they put on, like, um, the magic flute, right? Like something that is a little um, more, you know, serious, so to speak. But I think even the kind of drama that we're talking about in something like the magic flute is very different than the kind of drama that we're talking about in the ring, right? I mean, it is like 
maybe cosmic in the sense that you have like, I don't know, these like mythical figures or something, you know, but it's not, it isn't sort of this like existential sort of meso- metaphysical thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so I think in a very conscious sense, they really want to not be that. Um, they, they, they want, uh, I think, and I think part of that is, I mean, Strauss, who is involved in this, even though he's not as much into the theorizing, and part of the reason why is, I mean, Richard Strauss sees himself as writing very, very good music and does not believe in really anything at all. <laughs> and so, like, Strauss is, like, not religious in any sense of the word. Like, he is doesn't... Is he nationalistic in any way? No. I mean, Strauss is sort he's, of... He's a curious character. So his yeah. father yeah. was a great horn player, actually... Yeah. Played a lot of Wagner operas, I think, premiered yes, some yes, of them. Yeah. Um, and that was Richard Strauss Sr. Mm-hmm. And then you got Richard Strauss Jr., not to be confused with Johann Strauss Jr. <laughs> you got <laughs> Richard Strauss Jr. Um, and he writes a lot of operas yeah. and a lot of tone poems. But he's from Bavaria. Yes, he is from Bavaria. Oh, yes. He was born in Bavaria. Yes. But he moves to Austria and he's heavily involved with this festival? Yeah, so he, he's, well, he is very involved um, with, I believe he's very involved at the Vienna Court Opera, which later becomes the Staatsoper after the collapse of the empire. So he, he does some work there. Um, but, I mean, he, but, I mean, his, his, his home and sort of the, the place that he, um, he spends a lot of time in and works in is, of course, still in Munich, right? Um, or right outside of Munich, right in Garmisch Partengart. Um, uh, but he is not, I mean, we really can even see this in like the letters that sort of get him in trouble with the Nazis, you know, in like the, in the 1940s. Strauss is not really a, a, a like nationalistic sort of mm-hmm. person. I mean, he sort of famously says, you know, do you think that, you know, um, uh, Mozart or Beethoven were thinking about being Aryan? I only know two kinds of people, those with talent and those without and he's, he's not really, pe- he's, he, th- this is not really something that's on his mind. I mean, he starts, I think, as a Wagner acolyte, as a lot of people do at this time, of like, he's interested in, um, he, I mean, I think it, it is something that sort of fascinates him. Um, I believe he goes to see, like, Tristan, and it has, like, a huge impact on him. Um, but he, I think if he is, like, philosophical in any sense, it's, he's kind of a Nietzschean. Um, he, I mean, that, that's kind of what... Oh, that, of course. Like, yeah. Alpin Symphony. Yes, yes, exactly. Or, yeah, or, well, a lot of people know, like... Yes. So there's Zarathustra. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Also Spike Zarathustra. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that the original title for Alpin Symphony, or maybe it was the original subtitle, yeah. was uh, the, the... What was it? What was it? Superman? Yes, I think it, I think Every so. Man yeah. or Etch- yes, I don't know. Yeah. But it was a Nietzsche title. And yeah. it was sort of like a Nietzschean... Yeah. Story and then he just scrapped that and had Alpen Symphony and, mm-hmm. and now to everybody it just sounds like oh it's a mm-hmm. tone poem about mm-hmm. a walk in the Alps and actually there's this yeah in the creation of it there was this Nietzschean undertone yeah yeah um, right oh, yeah, I so mean that's what, I mean if he's anything he's a Nietzschean right, right. he's not really his his thing is not the like you know dramatic metaphysics of like a Wagner right yeah. and so you have these people and then of course you have like the central architect who really spends a lot of time thinking about this is this man named Hugo von Hofmannsthal who is most known to us in the English speaking world as Strauss the British mm-hmm. but in the German speaking world is a very 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 important author and poet of his mm-hmm. own you know he's kind of um, He's, I think someone once put it as he's sort of like the infant terrible of like, you know, German literature at this time. Mm-hmm. He's this like, he, he comes onto the scene very young um, and he doesn't, I think he only dies in his 40s, you know, but he yeah. sort of, he is, you know, in the, in, in, in the cafe sort of talking with the, 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 the poets and the writers of this time, you know, sort of as like this, you know, 19, 20 year old. Mm-hmm. Um, he, I mean, so somebody like, how far is he from somebody like Brecht? Like... Pretty far, or I mean, their 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 lifespan certainly overlap, but yeah. he, I mean, Hofmannsthal is, um, he's he, I mean, he's a symbolist. I mean, he's he's definitely a modernist, but he's a he's not a modernist in the kind of way that Brecht is, okay. you know. Um, and Brecht was the Berlin guy. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, and, and I want to say Brecht even writes a little bit about Salzburg. I can't remember what, but I don't think it's particularly glowing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, uh, Hofmannsthal by this time is very much seen as a conservative figure. Mm-hmm. Um, he care. I mean, he cares a lot about the monarchy, which no longer exists. Um, 
and he wants to create something that uh, sort of shows off the glory of uh, Habsburg sort of imperial culture um, and shows what life was like under the monarchy. I mean, and that's sort of the reason behind Mozart, right? Is because Mozart right. um, is in the age of Maria Theresa, mm -hmm. who sort of is this, uh, you know... The epitome. Yeah, the, 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 the epitome of sort of... Um, like the, it's kind of like a classical, you know, like a classical period of, of sort classical of culture. Throwing that aside, I'm yeah. Teresa, not, not a lot of people know this, but that she uh, founded La Scala. She was instrumental in building that. Oh, opera really? House. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, a lot of Italian opera yeah. culture, you know, that's deeply intertwined oh, with, well. yeah. with the Habsburgs, and of course, Italian opera was oh, the, yeah. that was the language of opera in the Vienna court. That's why yes. Mozart yes, wrote yes, all yes, those yes, yeah. operas in Italian. Like yeah. That no, I mean, but I, I think that I think that's a testament, really, to um, we are dealing with like kind of this. Um, um, we're dealing with a state that is not. We're we're dealing with these people who are not interested in necessarily being like reflexively German, mm -hmm. right? Like they're interested, I think, in exploring what it means to be German in an Austrian context. But you have mm -hmm. two guys who are Jewish, and the press and the. Like the the German sort of like nationalist press in Austria. You're talking about Hofmannsthal. Uh, yes. And yeah, and and, and um, Max, Max Reinhardt, yeah, yeah. Are, are both Jewish. You have the press at the time, um, like anti-Semitic press, writes pretty virulently of you mm. know, essentially what are these people doing? You know, uh, right. putting on sort of Mozart. You know, essentially that they're defiling. Mm. You know these works. Um, mm. Or you know Hoffman uh, Hoffmannsthal writes this play called Jedermann, um, that. Is put on every year, still to this date, at the Zalsberg Festival. It's kind of like a foil to Parsifal, right? Yeah, and I mean, in some ways, you could see it as that. I mean, it's it's a it's a journey of the soul. Um, I mean, it's it's essentially it's the you know, the premise of the play is you know this guy, um, God's not happy with him. God sends death to essentially tell him, you know, today your life is demanded of you. Um, the guy freaks out and like tries to figure out how is he going to get into heaven, and all of his friends abandon him. And the only things that really stay with him are like the virtues, and he sort of has to become this virtuous person. So like you know. an Austrian Christmas Carol. Yeah, <laughs> in some ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a perfect way of putting it. You know, it's it's a morality tale. Uh -huh. You know, it's uh -huh. trying to teach people to be good. Yeah. Um, well, the but, reason I said it was a foil to Parsifal is yeah. Parsifal's this stage concept. Yes, this is yeah, and it happens. Well, I don't know if it still happens this way, but it was supposed to be like at the beginning of the festival. Right. right? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. Consecrate the stage, which is a strong word. Hello, Hello Liam. So, so the, the reason I um, sort of made this comparison with Parsifal, uh, so the Yedermen is like Parsifal is, that, Parsifal is the stage yes. consecration play that happens every year at Bayreuth. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's the case still that it's supposed to kick off the festival mm -hmm. and really consecrate the stage, which is mm -hmm. a very strong and intentional word on Wagner's mm -hmm. part. And that uh, the Yederman was happening every year to start the festival. Yes, in yes, yes. Right. And... You wrote pretty eloquently about it. That it was in front of the cathedral. Yes, Stanford. it's in front of that, the cathedral. That was the stage yes, for that play. Yes, and that's what really ticks the anti semites off. Is because Max Reinhardt directs this play, and and Hoffman so wrote it, and they sort of see it as, I mean, to put it quite crudely, as they put it, that Jews are defiling this cathedral. I mean, so this is something that they are not thrilled about at all. I mean, and so I think for me, this really underlies the ways in which Salzburg is not a. It is. I think you can call it a lot of things. It is imperialist. It is very reactionary in some ways. Um, and what it's trying to do, you know, it's kind of irredentist in the sense that it wants to return to the empire. Um, but it's not really, it has a very nasty relationship, you know, with the, those, those nationalist forces in Salzburg do not get along very well, you know. But also it's kind of a cosmopolitan place. I mean, in the post-war period, certainly. But like, I mean, even at this time, celebrities from you know the u.s germany you know just come to it it's sort of this you know there's even a complaint that it sort of becomes too american around this time mm -hmm. you know so how how much has the salzburg festival maintained that identity you talk about in the 1920s and how different is it from bayreuth now well especially given the fact that they just closed the festival with a performance of Par parsifal Salzburg this, this year. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly Wagner gets performed much more at Salzburg now than it did, you know, um, in 1920, or where really there was no Wagner in 1920, but in the 1920s, right? 
Um, I mean, I think that Zosberg certainly seems to be one that, right, like, like Bayreuth is about Wagner. Zosberg, in some sense, is about a lot of other things that are not just Wagner. Even though Wagner gets performed there, there's a lots, of, lots of Verdi, there's lots of Mozart, right? You have Berlin Philharmonic visits, you know, the Wiener Philharmoniker is there during the summertime as well. Like, there's, it, it feels, I think, much more cosmopolitan European in that sense, right? Um, that, like, it's, there, there are a lot, there are performers from all over the world of, like, different calibers who were just coming to this, doing all kinds of different things, right? There's theater, there's Shakespeare, there's Yedermann, of course, but there's, there's Schiller, there's Goethe, there's, there's all, there are kinds of different things that are getting performed. There's more modern things. I'm sure Chekhov has been performed there. Like, it's, it's much more cosmopolitan. I think Bayreuth, Bayreuth is, I think about Wagner, and it is kind of about, for better or for worse, the cult of Wagner, right? You know, people go, they go to, they go, they see the villa, they see the piano, they cry, you know, there, there's like, it's, a, it's, it really is, I mean, Wagner, it is Hitler. the, like, he tried to, it Wagner's is sort of like great. the Wagner kind of, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's about, right? It's yeah. like you're sort of going, is, yeah. and you're paying, like, homage to the greatness of Richard Wagner, mm -hmm. but Bayreuth, I mean, but Salzburg is not really that, I mean, it's... And they only perform Wagner at Bayreuth. There will never be a new work. No, there will be no, 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 no. There will be never that. I mean, but at at, at Zosberg, thing, all kinds of things get put on. I mean, I think Herbert von Karajan is a very important person in the post-war about mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Zosberg. That's his pet project, and he really is very insistent that you get like people from all. I mean, every big singer performs mm -hmm. yeah. there. Leontine Price. The Leontine, I mean, yes, right. Like, huge deal. Like you're having huge like you, you're having. I think like racial, ethnic diversity, you're having diversity of works, like, it's, it's a truly cosmopolitan place, Carry on right? doesn't get yeah. enough credit for his diversity. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was quite a fan of Price, I mean, and he, he, was. he worked quite closely with her. And yeah. a lot of Jewish members in the Berlin Phil, of course, the concert yeah. master for many years, yes. all day. Yeah. Um, and, well, Carry On, he's a character who kind of ties into the Second World War, the Anschluss. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, do you have anything to say about that. I know a little bit about how that played out musically, but of course this is a kind of the culmination of the Germany versus Austria and the idea of a nation being defined by language. Yeah. Yeah. So in the that that's I mean that this is important that um Austria is a, sort of the Austria Habsburg Empire is a society that is very heavily bifurcated um by social class. So, like, the serfs are not emancipated until 1848. Um, and the, you have a middle class that is um, sort of made up of industrialists, many of them being Jewish. So a lot of the land within the first district, within the Ringstrasse in Vienna, was like something like 90% of it was owned by, by, by Jewish people. Um, and, like, the in like the, the yeah around with, the nineteen hundred within the Ringstrasse. Oh, yes. yes. And the Ringstrasse is a fairly recent... Yes, that's what, I mean, that's, that's part of kind of... That's a liberal project, I mean, right. itself. Okay, so know. like the center of, when you go to Vienna yeah. and you look at the Staatsoffer yeah. and the museums yeah. and the palaces, yes. that land that's within the Ringstrasse. Yes, that was mostly owned by Jews in the 1900s, oh. in the early 1900s. Um, Were all the palaces there? Not all of them, but I mean, it's something like, it's something like 90% of okay. that land was owned by Jews. Um, because, yeah. That's right, that's implied. Yeah. Um, I mean, so you, you, you have this, you know, you, you have this like middle class and you have sort of this very absolutist upper class that doesn't like that its power is being taken away from him, it. Um, though not necessarily for anti-Semitic reasons, um, but then you have the lower classes that I think start to really resent the middle classes. So by the time of the Anschluss, there is a huge amount of like anti-Semitism that's been fomented amongst the lower classes in, in um, Austria more broadly. Um, and so you're dealing with a different kind of culture than the one that we're talking about, you know, in the like 1850s or something like that. Um, so, I mean, at Salzburg, this changes. I mean, you get a lot of Wagner that ends up being performed at Salzburg. Um, and you have, I think, pressure to, you know, the, you, you have pressure, I think, to um, shun uh, works that have a lot of contribution from... Uh, either like sort of Jewish artists 
Um, or even ones that are about freedom, right? So like Fidelio gets quite a lot of play as mm -hmm. Zosberg before um, the Anschluss, and then after so it's gone. It's gone. Until or like Hungarian war. touches are kind of pushed aside. No, yeah, yeah, I mean it becomes pretty. It it the program as Zosberg starts to look very similar to that of Bayreuth. Well, I know that um, I, I did some study on Furt Wagner. Yeah. And he fought against. And I, I think he's really a hero. Sometimes mm. he gets, because he was in some hearings for denazification. Yeah. And he, he stayed in with the Berlin Phil. Yeah. Um, but he was a thorn in Hitler's side the whole time. And actually, that's one of the reasons Carry On came to prominence, was they needed to have a, a card to play against Furt Wagner because he was giving them so much trouble. They said, hey, well, we're going to pump this young kid up and push you out. And Furt Wagner was like, whatever. Yeah. Kept doing his thing. Um, and he made a midnight escape like... Uh, Sound of Music style yeah. from Salzburg. Yeah, actually, after a performance yeah. of Brahms too, which great recording. Yeah. We have that concert. Yeah. Oh wow, it's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, um, wow. but he was fighting against this plan to subsume the Vienna Philharmonic into the Berlin Philharmonic. Yeah, and the Salzburg Festival into Bayreuth. Yeah, and like really try to erase a separate and distinct Austrian oh, culture. Yes. Yeah, that was happening there. Oh yeah, I mean, it's they're really they're very different institutions. I think in what their kind of their their audience and their their mindset is, you know. Um, and I think I think today, I think today, right? Like you know, Bayreuth at least until recently, right, was really the Wagner family mm -hmm. project, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Zosberg uh, Zosberg is not is not like that at all. Um, and I think that's what makes it such a fascinating place is that. It sort of starts as this very intensely um, sort of reactionary, perhaps for kind of thing, um, and I think, but I think that what is within that, I think, despite you know, all of sort of the the, the politics, you know, the conservative politics that sometimes really upset people about Salzburg, is there's a real commitment, I think, to a certain kind of cosmopolitanism, maybe a German cosmopolitanism, but there's a real cosmopolitanism that I think is in full bloom as Salzburg today, and that is not. True of my right. Mm -hmm. Do you um, most of the reviews out of Bayreuth aesthetically have been negative for the past like decade or two? Um, and I wonder if you, I mean, this is pure specula yeah. speculation, but let's say like 50 years down the line, mm -hmm. where do you see the Salzburg Bayreuth divide? Which, which, uh, which horse would you back? Definitely Zalsburg. I think Zalsburg has more of a potential to um, change itself. Mm. I think that, I think really what somewhere like Bayreuth suffers from in the post-war period, even though it, it, it still is very important for like Wagner, of course, as a, as like a musical thing, but it isn't as much of a cultural force. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, associations made either between Hitler and Bayreuth, even though I'm sorry, yeah, between Hitler and Bayreuth, even though the Nazis as a whole sort of found Hitler's fascination with Bayreuth to be rather tiresome mm -hmm. at best, um, and associations, of course, you know, the age-old association of, of Wagner with with with, with Nazism, um, right. and I think that that really tanks it as like able to do right. other things, right? Sure. And Salzburg is associated, the brand. yeah. I mean, yeah, it does. I mean, yeah. really, right? And and you know, Salzburg's associated with Strauss, and Strauss is still alive, you know, for a few years after the war, and and you know, um, it's 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 a different kind of, of thing, and I think that it's more capable of changing. Right. I don't know. I think somewhere like Bayreuth, um, even if even if the current changes. Yeah. Slightly more Wagnerian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It also has room to grow away from yeah. Wagnerian bent. Yeah. <laughs> but in, I, in both cases, I think that they're ossified. Yeah. Right? Like, once it happens with all these festivals, they start off kind of like upstart. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's like a real artistic mission. And then they get big, and then they, the first generation that had the vision, you know, passes away, and then it gets really institutionalized and it's successful oh, and it's stable and people yes. will come back oh yeah but it's a, a, a lot more codified and it's like a program and they figure out what works for business yeah, structure it's a, it's a thing that... so the artistic uh like 
punchiness and relevance is totally missing and you are always looking for a new generation yes doing new festivals and creating new things to, to find that yeah you're not going to get it from the same festivals that have been around for a hundred years I think in Austria Salzburg is sort of re regarded as less for its cultural power in terms of what actually is going up so much as um, there's this wonderful novel called Malina um, which is by Ingeborg Bachmann who is this you know Austrian um feminist writer and in the novel you know they go to the Salzburg festival and most of it is literally them kind of sitting around and like talking you know because it's a going to Salzburg is much more about being po posh if you're Austrian than about actually seeing the music mm -hmm. and they actually see Carry On conduct the Verdi Requiem and they complain about how much they hated mm -hmm. Carry On's conducting mm -hmm. the entire mm -hmm. time so I mean, they're not really interested in the music. So it's that kind of illustrated. Well, my dear Nightmarians, if you've made it this far into the podcast, I can only say thank you for making it through what was a long and winding road that I hope you found to be somewhat interesting. Uh, I know that Dan and I very much appreciated our conversation with Julian and learned a lot from uh, his knowledge on the kind of tangled mess that is Austrian, German, Wagner, Strauss, pre, post, who knows which where we're talking about anymore, history. Uh, as always, you can get in touch with us through the website, through Instagram, through our phone numbers, which most of you should have, honestly. Um, and if you don't, maybe we should have a Wagner's Night Nightmare hotline and one of you people could like just be on 24-7 duty to just pick up the Wagner's Nightmare hotline. We should probably have a hotline. Um, stay tuned for the next episode. Instagram's the best way. Love you guys. Bye!